Hello, Ian Pobbery here. I want to tell you a little bit about my book, Introduction to Game Physics with Box2D. Now, these are the lecture notes for the first class I give in my uh, Programming Game Math and Physics class at the uh, University of North Texas. The uh, supplementary material online consists uh, co includes a full set of lecture notes for the book. So if you're an inst instructor, you can download those and uh, go ahead and use them in your class. Uh, there are integrated code demos too. So the contents of this lecture, uh, first I tell my students what the class is all about and tell them about my book. The book has two parts. Each part has about three or four chapters. Uh, there are chapter outcomes. I'll talk about those so you know what you would expect to know after reading and understanding each chapter. Talk a little bit about the code which you can download online and then we'll finish with a quick conclusion. So here goes. What this class is all about. Well, game physics. So, here you are, the novice, over on the left. Over on the right, we have the fully trained 2D game physics programmer. You want to get from the left over to the right. And in the middle, if you go online and look at um, go, go Google game physics, you'll find all kinds of stuff that you need to know and the stuff online is not particularly well organized some of it's really really good some of it's really really bad it's hard to tell the difference and it's hard to integrate everything into an organized set of knowledge so we're going to use box2d as a bridge that takes you over this mess and lets you code game physics easily Now, rather than telling you how to build Box2D, which would be a waste of time because somebody's already built it, I want to concentrate on uh, how to use it. But, of course, to know how to use it properly, you need to know a little bit about what's going on inside. So I can't completely skip the design. So what we'll do is we'll start out at the novice end, coding some game physics from scratch, just so that you can see the major problems that come up and uh, some of the techniques you use to overcome those problems. Over on the right, what we'll do is show how to use Box2D to uh, code your game physics. So the left is part one of the book, the right is part two of the book. The missing stuff in the middle, yeah, we're going to skip over that. We're going to use a, uh, if you like, a, a swing rope to swing from one side to the other without getting into the details of how Box2D was coded, which, if you're really interested, after you've read the book, you should know enough to be able to go read that code directly. It's open source. Go grab it. Take a look at it. But I'm going to tell you about the fun parts. How to get started. How to get finished. So my book looks like this. Over on the left. Um, at the top we see some math. Yeah, we're going to have to do some math. Then we can start coding games. Uh, a pool game. Simple physics, balls colliding, landing in pockets. Uh, we'll find out that's pretty easy. It's slightly harder to do some soft body physics. Oh, but the pool game is what we call rigid body physics because everything is hard and rigid and bounces off each other. Below it we've got some soft body physics, some balls and springs and a ragdoll. I'll show you how to do that. All of the left hand side is from scratch without using Box2D so that you can see the techniques used over on the right. We see from part two uh, how to use Box2D to do some cool things. We start at the top with just getting started, having some objects bouncing around on the screen. Uh, then we make a simple game where we fire a cannon to knock over a tower of books. That's the second animated GIF over on the right. The uh, third animated GIF uh, shows you a little bit about more how to integrate your physics code into your game engine using what's called a collision manifold. 
at the bottom we see oh, something a little more interesting. A game, of course, is something that you play in order to uh, win or lose. You win by knocking down the tower of books. You lose by accidentally making the cannon blow up. Oh, oh yeah, some games you don't win or lose, but this kind of game, you do. Alright, so why am I concentrating on 2D game physics here? Well, because it's both practical and useful. It's practical because it's been used in some successful commercial 2D video games. So you could actually learn this stuff, make a 2D video game and go make some money. It's practical. It's useful because even if you're not interested in 2D game physics in its own right, if you're really interested in 3D game physics, you'll find that moving from 2D to 3D game physics is relatively easy. I say relatively compared to how hard it is to go from uh, 2D linear algebra to 3D linear algebra. All right, so as I said before, the textbook has two parts, the beginning of the bridge and the end of the bridge. There's some overlap. Over on the left, in uh, pink there, we see the introduction to game physics part. That's part one of the book, where I show you what game physics is all about and why we need uh, a professional physics engine to lighten our load. Part two is game physics with box 2D, the blue part, where we'll show how those things are done in a professional game engine. So two parts, part one and part two, which overlap. They're both about game physics. One is the introduction part. One is about the box 2D part. So in part one, the introduction to game physics part, there are four chapters. The first chapter is on mathematics, the mathematics of 2D game physics. And I'm sorry, it will take some math, mostly high school math, maybe a little bit of... Uh, uh, intro um, undergraduate mathematics, like some linear algebra, some um, mechanics, for example. The next chapter is on rigid body dynamics, and we illustrate that with the uh, pool end game, a pool pool. Then we do soft body dynamics, um, where uh, we can do, for example, that ball and spring toy there. We can bounce around. And some uh, ragdoll physics, very simple 2D ragdoll physics. We see a wooden robot there kind of slamming around and dancing. Second part is game physics with box 2D. As I told you, getting started shows you how to uh, download the code, integrate it into your game engine. We have a mini game knocking down the books and we talk about collision manifolds and uh, how to destroy th things. All right, so each part has three to four chapters. Sorry, I lied there. The first part has three chapters. The second part has four. All right, so chapter one, read me first, gets you warmed up. Chapters two, three, and four are part one, math for game physics, rigid body physics, soft body physics. Part two is four chapters, getting started with box 2D. A tale of three modules tells you about three modules that uh, the code is broken up into. Um, we look at a simple cannon game and drill down into the collision module of box 2D and how we use it in the cannon game. Finish with some appendices. Appendix A is for math geeks only. Go, drills down into some mathematical details of some of the stuff in chapter 2. Um, Appendix B talks about the black art of program debugging. Uh, I, I've done this because a lot of books don't cover much about debugging. You're expected to learn how to do it on your own. There is an art to it, though. Um, Appendix C talks about intelligent questions and dumb questions. You may have been told there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, there are, in fact, dumb questions. Appendix D briefly dips into bullet physics. Now, Box 2D is essentially a cut-down version of bullet physics, which is an open-source 3D physics engine. Once you've mastered box 2D, bullet physics isn't too much harder. 
All right. Now, educators like to talk about outcomes. I'm not. We're not so focused on what's in the book. What's more important is what you get out of it when you finish it. So, what are the outcomes that I expect from each chapter? All right. So, in section one, uh, you're going to get to grips with the trials and tribulations of programming game physics from scratch by hand, bare-brained, with no physics engines or outside help. It's not pretty, but it's fun. So, chapter two, Math for Game Physics, talks about the mathematical foundation of game physics. So we're going to use geometry, linear algebra, and calculus, and how it can be applied in practice. So not just the math, but what we use it for. Expected outcomes, after you've read this chapter and done the problems and, and maybe written some code, here's what I expect you should know. You should understand what vectors are, angles are, reflection is. Um, you may recollect this, the memories of how much you hated linear algebra and geometry in school. And I'm sorry to uh, bring back those suppressed memories. Uh, hopefully we can overcome that. Um, Outcome number three, uh, understanding of why in code we use the ATAN2 function, not the ATAN function. Outcome four is a vague recollection that sines and cosines have something to do with horses and hippies. And if you don't understand that, go look at the book and you'll see why. Um, another outcome is that you should understand the concepts of Euler integration and Verlet integration and their roles in game physics. Now you may recall what Euler integration is. Uh, Verlet integration, you probably won't, but we'll fix that in this chapter. Outcome 6, you'll know about the mathematical technique of relaxation. Um, we're going to use a kind of relaxation called Gauss-Seidel relaxation. Now, outcome 7, very important. I hope that by the time you finish this chapter you'll realize that despite the hairy math and the scary names, Verlet integration and gauss sedel relaxation just boil down to a couple of lines of code. Surprise, surprise. But it has to be the right couple of lines. And that's what we'll focus on. Now, in Chapter 3, I'll show you how to code a rigid body physics game, the 8-ball pool endgame. Now, that's something you don't see a lot on uh, web pages uh, about Box 2D. Somebody's showing how to take that game engine and integrate it into um, a real game. So, okay, part one doesn't use Box 2D, but I'll show you where a physics engine would fit into uh, a game engine. So, after you've read and understood this chapter, I expect that you will, number one, know some simple algorithms for the computation of mo motion and impulse. Oh, yeah, very simple. Trivial. But, yeah, we need to get over this first. Um, outcome two, the ability to recognize where code for 2D physics fits into a game. So if you're developing a new game, where you should put the physics, and if you're looking at somebody else's code, where you would expect to find the physics. Um, very important outcome three, by the time you've uh, looked at this code and played with it, I hope you'll be familiar with the supporting game code used throughout the book that I've tr tried to make consistent through the chapters. And of course, after you've played this pool end game enough, uh, you'll probably have a sudden desire to play a ball pool in real life. Chapter 4 is on soft body physics, and it shows you how to code a soft body physics toy. Again, from scratch. No physics engines. The expected outcomes are you'll be familiar with using Valet integration for programming game physics. Now, Chapter 3. Uh, of course, use uh, the old-fashioned um, uh, uh, oil integration. Um, you have experience with applying Gauss-Seidel relaxation to implement springs and sticks. So the animated GIF top left there has springs, bouncy things. Over on the right, the dancing robot is made up of interconnected sticks. You can do both with Gauss-Seidel relaxation. And uh, outcome three. You'll be familiar with how to use Verlet integration and gauss seidel relaxation then to implement ragdoll physics. 
All right, once we've plowed through that, section two, game physics with Box2D, in which I expect you to learn how to use Box2D to go beyond what were essentially baby steps in part one. Chapter five is getting started with Box2D, in which I'll show you how to download Box2D, set up Visual Studio, and write a simple toy. Expected outcomes of this chapter are, uh, well, I hope by the time you finish, you've got Box 2D so correctly downloaded, integrated with Visual Studio, and ready to rock and roll. Um, I'll also show you the basic concepts used in Box 2D, the terminology, how the code is broken up. An important concept that we need to get through is that uh, uh, we need to understand that physics units should not be pixels. When we're moving stuff around on the screen, yeah, we measure that in pixels. But physics units should not be pixels. Physics units should be a floating point value, and uh, I'll show you why in this chapter. And of course, you'll come out of this chapter with experience using Box2D in a simple application. That little uh, animated GIF top left shows you just a bunch of uh, yeah balls and books there falling from the sky and bouncing around. Now, chapter 6 is called A Tale of Three Modules. We'll look at the three modules that make up Box2D. They're called the Common Module, the Collision Module, and the Dynamics Module. Expected outcomes from this chapter are, well, number one, knowledge of, of the... knowledge of... sorry, knowledge of what basic functions are included in the math library in the common module, understanding of the role of the collision module, what contact manifolds are, and how broad phase collision detection works. Um, you'll also come out with uh, at least some memory of how uh, of what shapes box 2D provides. Uh, obviously circles and boxes there for that animated GIF top left. Um, you'll understand what the dynamics module is, what the physics world is, and what fixtures and bodies are in Box2D. Um, you should understand what the integrator and the constraint solver do. Uh, of course, we're not going to drill down too deeply into the internals of them. Uh, you should also figure out what parts of the ball and spring toy in Chapter 4 the integrator and the constraint solver correspond to. Box2D also gives you some joints so you can connect um, objects in your game. Uh, you should know what joints Box2D provides and what they mean. Chapter 7 is on the cannon game. Now the cannon game gives you control of a cannon and you're expected to knock down a tower of books within 60 seconds without overheating your cannon. So after this chapter you should know how to use Box2D to make a simple game. You should be familiar with those concepts we introduced in the previous chapter. Box2D bodies, fixtures, and joints. and Hopefully by the time you've played this game a bit, you'll be able to knock down a tower of books with a cannon very quickly without blowing it up, which is a real-life skill that everybody needs. Chapter 8 is on the collision module. We'll drill down a little bit into that code. We'll look at contacts, contact manifolds, contact listeners, AABBs, axi axially aligned bounding boxes, and a data structure called dynamic trees. I expect you to come out of this chapter with a deeper understanding of how a contact manifold works, an understanding of why the user data field in B2BodyDef is so useful. B2BodyDef is a, uh, a data structure inside Box2D. Um, the user data field is used to connect um, your bodies with the code in your game engine. And yeah, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense now, but it will after you finish this chapter. Outcome number three, you should understand what a contact listener is and what events are likely to cause its pre-solve function to be called. Outcome four, knowledge of how to get information from a contact manifold in the contact listener's pre-solve function. Of course, outcome five, experience using a contact listener to monitor collisions. Outcome number six, now this is a bit advanced. Uh, knowledge of what AABBs, axially aligned bounding boxes, are and how dynamic trees work. You don't really need to know how dynamic trees work for uh, to be able to use Box2D, but it is really cool. And I want to show you uh, uh, the details of that data structure. 
let me talk a little bit about the code I provided for this book. Now, this is going to be a bit controversial, I know. I've written the code in C++ for Microsoft Visual Studio 10. Now, yeah, I know some of you don't like Microsoft, some of you don't like Visual Studio, some of you don't like C++. Now, I looked around and I saw lots of examples on the web, but I saw very few uh, in C++ for Visual Studio, so I decided to do that. Go look at the other stuff yourself. As a game programmer, if you really seriously want to be a game programmer, then you want to program as many different uh, in as many different programming languages for as many different platforms using as many different compilers as you can. So no excuse for not learning how to do this stuff. Even if you hate Microsoft, you may end up working for a company that um, develops using their tools. Now, if you're at a university, if the university has MSDN AA, the Microsoft Developer Network Academic Alliance, you'll be able to download Visual Studio. Now, the current version is Visual Studio 11. You'll be able to download Visual Studio for free and use it. Otherwise, you'll have to buy a copy, I'm afraid. You can download the source code and a full set of Visual Studio solutions and projects from the book's web page, which I'll tell you more about later. This engine uses DirectX 9 for graphics, but you don't need to be an expert graphics or Windows programmer because there's already a graphics engine built in, and I've kind of isolated that for you into a set of uh, library functions so you don't get tempted to go in there and mess with it. So you'll concentrate on the main part of the game and uh, your, your physics code. Don't worry about the graphics stuff. I've taken care of that. So the organization of the code. I've organized the code using a concept of what I call game worlds. The player down there at the bottom is out in the real world, interacting with the game through uh, input devices like the mouse and the keyboard, and uh, um, um, learning about what the game is doing by looking at the graphics and maybe sound too, but concentrate on graphics here. Now inside the computer, I've broken things up into two different worlds, object world and render world. Object world is, if you like, a world of abstractions an abstract ball floating around in space. Render world is the graphics, how that appears on the screen. So the ball in render world has a position in pixels on the screen. The ball in object world can have that position expressed in some other way, in world coordinates, which may extend beyond the screen. So I'm going to separate those two out. Later on in the game, I'll add a separate world, physics world, which is totally different. An object will have three representations then, how it looks, how it acts, physics world, and uh, its abstract representation. Drilling down into that a little bit, we're going to have a function called render frame, which I'm going to call once per frame of animation, hopefully 60 times a second, to render a frame of animation for your game onto the screen. Now, what render frame do, will do, it'll ask the object world to draw something. Let's say we're drawing a pirate on the screen. So render frame will call a function that asks the object world to draw the pirate. Object world knows about a pirate object, knows some other information about it, so maybe the pilot pirate is feeling relaxed, so we've got it coded as being in relaxed state. We know its position in uh, world coordinates, 512.34, 10.6 xy coordinates, I guess. We know it's not moving, so its velocity is zero. Uh, we know it, uh, what it looks like. We've got a pointer to its sprite over in render world. We've also got an object world uh, information about other objects too, like, for example, a parrot. We're not using them right now. We're trying to draw the parrot. So the object world, uh, so render frame asks the object world to draw the pirate. Object world looks up the information about the pirate and says, OK, render world, draw the pirate sprite. And I've got to point it to it here at 512.10 on the screen. Notice we've taken that floating point position, 512.34, 10.6, and uh, kind of rounded that down to 512.10 because pixel coordinates are integers. Uh, we don't have to measure position in object world in uh, exactly the same kind of coordinates like that. We could um, 
For example, position could be 1,512, 1,010.6 and just uh, clip off the bottom part of the number if you wish. But here I've made them similar. All right, so um, Object World knows uh, to tell Render World to draw the pirate sprite and where to do it. Uh, Render World says, no problem. Render World has in it oh, some images, some information about um, the uh, video screen, its width and height, and a little piece of code called a renderer. The renderer is the, yeah, the DirectX 9 stuff that actually does the drawing. All it does is know how to draw pictures on the screen. So the Render World tells the renderer, go ahead, draw this picture at this place on the screen. So it goes ahead and draws it. So that's the basic process, how the worlds interact to once per frame of animation draw stuff on the screen. All right, we're done. Now, suggested reading. I suggest you read chapter one of the book if you've bought it. If you haven't bought it yet, I hope I've tempted you into buying it. Look at Appendix B, too, while you're about it. Suggested activities. Um, I, I would like you to explore the book's web page, which I'll tell you about on the next slide. Download the code and the executables from the book web page. Um, try running the executables and see how they work. Uh, obtain and install Visual Studio 10 or 11, let's say now, and uh, maybe try compiling the code and uh, see what happens. Once you've done that, you'll be ready to rock and roll with the next chapter. So supplementary material is available on uh, my book web page. That's lock.unt.edu slash ian slash books slash game physics or just Google my book. You'll find links to that web page. There are some YouTube videos. There's the uh, lecture notes, some errata from the book, the code. Yeah, all kinds of neat stuff. There's a forum too. You can go on and discuss uh, things related to the game. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.